Okay, perfect. Okay, well, good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, today is July the 10th, 2021, and I want to welcome everyone uh, back or welcome to, if this is your first time, uh, the World Citizen Virtual Book Club. Um, just want to say with the uh, United States, up, oh, please put your, uh, your, your computer on mute, please. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so with um, just wanted to say with the United States easing its COVID restrictions, uh, I hope that you've all had a chance to see friends and family that you haven't seen in quite a while, uh, maybe do some traveling. And uh, for those of you who um, you may be out of the US, it looks like right now everybody is, is here, although I, there is someone coming in from Mexico, I believe, um, and we've had inquiries from elsewhere. But nevertheless, um, for those of, the, of you in the rest of the world, uh, just our blessings go out for you for your safety and the, and the safety of everyone in your nation, uh, not to mention the rest of the world. And, you know, there's been many articles written over the last few months that the pandemic is yet another demonstration of why we need a world federation. Uh, so um, so we're, we're living in one of them right now. So um, if you're on the call for the first time, and I actually see one name that I'm not familiar with, uh, my name is Bob Flax. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, and I'll be facilitating the session. Um, I am working with Gail Hughes, um, who was on just a moment ago. Uh, she's on our board, and she's a coor the coordinator of the book club. Uh, again, I will ask if everyone could mute their phone. I hear papers rustling and some other things in the background. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, so as Gail said a few moments ago, we're beginning a new book, um, One World Democracy, A Progressive Vision for Enforceable Global Law. It's co-authored by Jerry Tiedelman and Byron Belitzos. And, um, and we are fortunate enough to have Jerry with us uh, for today. And he, he let me know that he will, um, you know, he may be traveling at some points, but whenever he's available, he will come on to these sessions and join us. So. Um, that would be terrific. We've all had that experience of having the author with us. Um, during the break, you may recall that we voted on um, how we would select our, our books and the having the author with us um, took an early lead. I thought that was gonna be the winner, uh, but much to my surprise, um, having us select the books our, ourselves each time um, came in right at the end as a tie. Um, so uh, Jerry's book was one of those that we had already been discussing in some months past. It was suggested by one of the folks who were suggesting books. Um, so, and, and I had known him and wanted to basically try to, try to uh, confirm someone before we lost them for the summer. Uh, so I called Jerry right away. And, um, and he happens to be on uh, CGS's social media team so I thought it was pretty safe to assume that he's still alive. We wanted living <laughs> authors. So, yeah. um, so I called him, confirmed he has a pulse. Yeah, he was happy to join us. Um, so, um, so yeah, so Jerry, Jerry will be with us. Before I introduce him, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping matters um, to remind people how we operate. So before each session, um, we will point out how many chapters um, we'll be doing. Uh, Jerry's book seems to be very conveniently organized where there are three main parts to it. And it looks like um, we're going to kind of start out by, by looking at taking two sessions on part one. Um, so it's three chapters each, two sessions on part two. Uh, one will be three chapters, one will be four chapters. And then one session on part three and the appendices and any open discussion. So we'll, we'll see if, if everyone says, you know, we could read more or we want to go slower. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to get that and any other feedback. And you could certainly email that to Gail and I um, after each session. So, um, so we, um, uh, what was I, uh, I have a few points I'm reading here. Let me make sure. Okay, yes. So, um, da, 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 da. yeah. So um, at each session, um, Jerry will have a chance to introduce that section, kind of briefly summarize it, talk about what he sees as the main points. Again, each time we ask everyone to go on mute um, so we don't have the children screaming and the, the dogs barking. Um, after Jerry is done, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, I will um, make a list of the people who want to um, want to ask questions. It's easiest um, if you go to the, in, in the bottom of Zoom, if you're not familiar with it, 
If you bring your cursor down, there's a, a bar down there with different commands. If you go to reactions and click on reactions, one of them is to raise your hand. And if you click raise your hand uh, through the wonders of modern technology, it will put you on our screen at the top in the order that people raise their hand. So it makes it really easy to track. Um, if you're calling in by phone and can't do that, then you just need to you know, shout out and say, I, I wanna get on the list. Um, so, that, so again, I invite everybody to use the hand raising function. That seems to work very well. Um, so when people ask questions, we ask you or make comments, we ask you to be brief. Uh, please refrain from any lectures or if you're promoting your you know, newest book or latest event or something like that, uh, please don't do it at that point. We have time at the end for announcements. So you can do any promotion that you'd like at that point. Um, and then at about 10 minutes before the end of the session, uh, we'll stop for those announcements. Um, and then Gail will, you know, kind of will close by verifying when our, la when our last meeting is, or next, I'm sorry, next meeting is, and if there are any other loose ends, any housekeeping matters that we need to go over. Um, so first, any questions about the format? I mean, we're, most of us are all veterans, so it doesn't look like, um, okay, there's any confusion. All right, um, two other quick things. One is um, in the past, we have talked about Zoom bombing. Uh, for those of you not familiar with that term, uh, it seems to be a hobby among some people. They go on to Zoom meetings that they're have no part of or not invited with, but somehow hack in and disrupt those meetings in some way. Um, I think in, in, since we've been doing things on Zoom, I think we had one of those in one of our groups, uh, but we've largely been spared. But nevertheless, if someone appears by magic in the middle of a meeting, uh, we will stop. We will ask them to identify themselves, you know, if their name isn't already there and we're familiar with them. And if they don't identify themselves, we will show them to the cyber door um, and uh, push the magic button and off they will be. Um, the other thing is we don't tend to monitor the chat, um, but I will, so any conversations and stuff there, um, great, go ahead and have them, but we won't be reading the chat at the same time. However, if something happens like your sound goes out or whatever, we wanna know if that's just in your system or across the board, so by all means, put that in the chat. And Gail, if you can just keep your eye out for those kinds of things, you know, emergencies or, or stuff of that sort, uh, the usual chatting, we won't interfere with or, or do anything with. Um, we welcome any feedback, as I said, um, send Gail and I uh, emails. That's how we keep getting better at this, uh, by hearing what works and what doesn't work. Um, so with that, I'm gonna change gears. And um, as I said, right before we started recording, um, since Jerry doesn't know, oh, I shouldn't say doesn't know anyone here. He knows a few people here. But I know several people here, yeah. Oh, okay, terrific. So I'm gonna invite um, everyone to briefly say three things. Um, one is your name. Uh, two is where in the world you are located. And the third, this is the tricky one, one optional sentence. So it, first it's optional, you don't have to say anything but please no run on sentences that go on for 15 minutes. Um, so what I will do is, uh, you know, with lots of commas, you know, so um, what I will do is I'll go first just to start the ball rolling and demonstrate. And then I will go uh, in the order that I see people on my screen. Um, and it's not always the same on di different screens, just for you to know. Um, so that will move it quicker than waiting for the next person and having silences in between and all that stuff. Um, and again, when you're, when after you speak, oh, well now I invite you to come off mute for when you speak, and then after you speak to go back on mute. So, um, so starting with me, so my name is Bob Flax. As I said, I live in Northern California, about an hour north of San Francisco. And I'm excited because in a few days we start our world, um, the World Federalist Movement Congress, and there's gonna be a number of changes, I think, in the organization. So excited to see how that goes. So, um, so that's me. So I will go to Father Ben. I'm uh, here at uh, Columbia Jesuit uh, Retirement, and uh, I'm a veteran of World War II, and that's what got me interested in doing away with war. 
So I'm glad to be here. Uh, I, I expect uh, us to, to, to promote uh, uh, World uh, Federation. One world. We're one human family. We should act that way. We have right. one, Thank common, you. One, one common home. Thank you, Father. Um, okay, moving along, Ron Glossop. My name is Ronald Glossop. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. And the one issue that I'm going to want to bring up near the end has to do with how nationalism is not just a matter of politics, but also a matter of language. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Lee Davis, and you are on mute at the moment. Uh, known as Sher I'm, I'm Shirley Davis, better known as Lee, <laughs> and I live in Orono, Maine, and I'm a retired biologist. Right. Welcome, Lee, and Melanie, and you're on mute. Hello, everyone. This is so exciting to see Jerry here. Um, so Melanie Bennett, a living in Alcohome, California, Earth, and producer on The World is My Country film. Excited, excited about this book, so. Terrific, welcome, Melanie. And the smiling photograph of author, and you're on mute. <laughs> Author, are you at the computer? Okay, I will move on and we'll come back to author. Um, Lisbeth. There I am. Oh, author okay, is here. Okay, I'm here, okay. just had to unmute. Yes. Okay, un unlist. Okay, so this is Arthur Canius. I'm on the beach here in Baja, Mexico. Uh, actually, uh, to be walking the beach with the dogs while we're talking, just was heading out the door, but came back in to say hi a quick, quick hi. Um, yeah, thrilled to be here. A great book and looking forward to the discussion of it. And I guess many of you know, we, uh, we'll talk about it in the announcements, but uh, it was on Tom Hartman this week with Martin Sheen. So we'll tell you more about that. It's at the worldismycountry.com slash talks. Great. Uh, so we'll, we're really looking forward to this book. Good book. Thank you, Arthur. And uh, Lisbeth, you're on mute. And I think, are you new to our group? Uh, yeah, I'm the second winner of the, you know, the essay contest. Oh, cool. Yeah, this is my first time joining. I'm calling from New York, and I'm really excited about this meeting. Terrific. Welcome. Welcome to the gang. Okay. Thank you. And uh, next up, Ted. Hello, colleagues, uh, comrades, co-conspirators. Uh, three sentences, one, or three points. Uh, I am Tad Daly. Uh, I am in Los Angeles. Um, on planet Earth, as Melanie says, our deepest identity. And uh, and more than 10 years ago, I learned a great deal from reading the uh, Tettleman and Belitzos book. And uh, that's why I uh, decided to join in today. And I'm also a regular listener to Tom Hartman, but I, I guess I haven't heard this uh, segment yet. So I really will uh, look forward to uh, finding that online and hearing it. Great, welcome, Ted. Uh, Evan. Hi, uh, Evan Troy, Chicago, Illinois. I've been a student of political theory since college, and I love the transformations that Jerry has brought about in this book. Thank you. Uh, Dave Orton, and you're on mute. Okay. Uh, Dave Orton from St. Louis. I'm on the national board and uh, St. Louis board of CGS. And I'm glad that um, Elizabeth could be with us. She was one of our St. Louis essay contest winners this past year. Uh, so welcome, Elizabeth, and I hope you can uh, be here on other discussions. Thank and you. I'm um, a retired teacher of the world's religions at St. Louis University. Great. Welcome. And Carla. And you are. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Carla Mae Streeter. I'm a Dominican uh, in St. Louis, and I'm emerita professor at um, in Aquinas Institute of Theology. And I was invited into the group by Dave Auten, for which I'm grateful. Terrific. And uh, Gail. Surprised you. <laughs> Did you call on me? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm Gail Hughes and I'm on the national board. I'm the 
book club coordinator, as Bob mentioned. And I just um, have somebody else join us here, Paul Price, who is my housemate. Um, he's interested in World <laughs> Federation, and so I encouraged him to, to join us. Terrific. You say something, Thanks. Paul? Oh, oh just, just proceed, please, please. Okay. I'm sure anybody who's a housemate of Gail will have to be interested in World Federation. <laughs> that, that's been, that's been, that's been drawn in. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Donna. I'm Donna Park. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio on planet Earth. Um, and I'm just so excited to have Lisbeth with us. And I want her to know that we have a relationship with the Young World Federalist. So I hope she doesn't get turned off by all us old people. So uh, we'd love to introduce you to the young people. And there's even a women's channel that I'd love to invite you to in, the, in their group. So. Okay. That thank sounds you. really interesting. Good. Thank you. Uh, David Gallup. Hi, I'm David Gallup. I'm in my basement. So my feet are touching planet Earth. <laughs> uh, and uh, I really appreciate, Jerry, that you linked world citizenship and world government. It's something that I'm trying to do every day of my life at my day-to-day uh, -day job and, of course, on the, being on the board of CGS. So thank you for that. Terrific. And Barat. Did you call me? I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm Bharat, Bharat Parekh from St. Paul, Minnesota, originally from Bombay, India. Uh, well, it's Joe Schwartzberg who kind of recruited me to join CGS years and years ago. I was very active then with uh, Millennium Development Goals and now with Sustainable Development Goals. But I think this uh, pull towards uh, world of the future where everyone's together like Jerry's book that we are reading is really drawn me into this. Uh, at the same time, I keep busy with uh, another problem in the world, namely that of acute malnutrition among the children. So I'm quite involved in trying to end uh, childhood malnutrition in India and other parts of the world. That's, those are the two things that keep me busy. Otherwise, I'm trying to let go. <laughs> thank you. Ter terrific, thank you. So uh, according to my screen, we've gotten everybody in, but is there anyone that I missed that somehow the technology isn't showing them on the screen? Okay, hearing none, um, let me change gears to the, uh, our, our guest speaker. Um, so first, again, inviting everybody to go back on mute if you're not already on mute. Uh, for some reason, when you're in a room together, background noise is not as disruptive, but somehow in Zoom, it really is. Um, so please do whatever you need to do to hit the mute button and, uh, and make sure that, um, that you're on mute. So, um, so I first met Jerry Tiedelman probably a decade ago, maybe more. Uh, we were both on the board of another organization, the Democratic World Federalist, which is based in San Francisco. And I think his book may also be the first one that I read uh, on World Federation. It was a fabulous introduction. Uh, as you already heard, it also is Donna's first book. Um, Jerry is a businessman um, and mostly has been in real estate in Southern California. And if you missed the uh, little discussion <laughs> beforehand, um, that J Jerry seems to, whenever he introduces himself, he leaves out the fact that he ran for Congress um, against Daryl Issa, uh, who had some reputation some years ago. And if I remember correctly, Jerry got like 41% of the vote, maybe a little more. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, wasn't insignificant. So, um, so I will let Jerry continue on from there about both himself and what brought him to the movement, what prompted him to write the book, and then he'll talk about the first three chapters and then we'll open it up uh, for questions and comments. So with that, Jerry, um, I turn over to you and I'm gonna leave the screen for a minute while I push the button on my fan because we're in a heat wave here and I'm feeling it. Okay, Jerry, take it okay. away. Thanks, thanks, Bob. Um, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit, tell you how does, how does a person come to write, write a book like this? And I am a co-author, I'm not the sole author, and how I met Byron Belitzos and how we got together and did this. Uh, my background, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, 
and I was born in uh, 1954. I'm a baby boomer. Most of the people, the adults around me were either uh, either fought in World War II or in my case, there was quite a few people. Uh, my friends had, uh, their parents were survivors of the Holocaust. I lived in a Jewish community. And so I was raised with that idea about never again. And, you know, it kind of had an impact on me growing up. And then, of course, I, you know, became a teenager and it was the Vietnam War was going on. So I was a big protester. I was kind of a hippie and protested the war. And eventually I, I decided to register as a conscientious objector because the draft was going on and I didn't have to defend that because the draft ended the next year. So that was in 1972. I graduated high school in 73, the draft ended, but I went to a lot of anti-war protests and I was very involved in the anti-war movement, but I didn't have a concept at that time other than uh, this is not a just war. I thought World War II was a just war, but the Vietnam War seemed to not be a just war. It seemed to be something that we were uh, putting on an, another nation. Uh, so it wasn't until about 1984 and I was in, I lived in San Diego at the time. And then I, I was, uh, you know, kind of going through some career changes myself. I was working on my PhD in psychology. I decided to change careers and I was kind of searching. I was rather upset about uh, the politics at that time. That was Ronald Reagan was the president and the, you know, I'd grown up all throughout the, uh, cold war and nuclear weapons were just being accelerated. It was the period before the end of the Cold War where Reagan was accelerating the nuclear buildup. And it just seemed kind of crazy to me. I, I was kind of doing research a little bit. I, I came across this idea of a uh, world government. And I met, I met somebody from the World Federalist. I think that was Teresa Tonalski in San Diego. And I was excited about it. She talked to me about world federalism. And she, she took me to the National Convention in Los Angeles. There was a national convention for the World Federalist Association. And I went to that. And I thought that was, you know, it was great. And, but I, I didn't really understand the concept that much. It was something that um, I knew that a world government would be helpful, but I didn't really understand the idea of federation and all the nuances and why and all that. So it wasn't until years later, it was always in the back of my mind politically, um, I wondered why uh, the peace movement never really talked about World Federation, because I did still follow the peace movement. And it was in about 2003, there was the uh, George Bush was the president. And the United States was getting ready to invade Iraq and take out Saddam Hussein. And there was a buildup to that. And at that time, I was working as a real, uh, real estate broker. I was very I was pretty successful at that. I really was just kind of chasing money. And I'd always thought about getting back into learning more about world federalism. So I decided I wanted to educate myself. And so what I did was um, I started going to these anti-war protests. There was a lot of protests at that time trying to prevent the United States from going into Iraq. And because the United Nations Security Council would not approve it, it was, it was a unilateral move that was done against the international community. And I found that was the part that really uh, kind of bothered me. So I, I had the idea of, you know, I started educating myself and traveling around and I wanted to write a book. I began writing it. I was writing it for about a year. I really didn't have much background in writing. And I went to a convention in Copenhagen. It was the World Federalist, um, the national conference, you know, the international conference of the uh, World Federalist Movement in Copenhagen. I met uh, John Sutter. If anybody knows, you know, John Sutter was the head of the Democrat, uh, Democratic World Federalist in San Francisco. And he uh, discussed with me that he knew somebody, Byron Belitzos, that was interested in publishing a book and, you know, writing a book and getting it out there. And so he, he kind of put us two together and I eventually met Byron and we, uh, uh, Byron was much more educated about World Federalism than I. He had been involved in the movement for a long time. He had he was very intellectual. He had read all these books. He knew some of the people that were active in the movement. And he kind of mentored me and gave me lists of books to read. And I began studying uh, World Federalism. And, and I was influenced by a variety of different books. Um, one was The uh, uh, Soul of the Citizen. It, it, it's a book about um, uh, political activism. And what he says is that there's political activism is a two-step process. You first educate yourself. And then after you've fully educated yourself, you go out and you begin to speak, you begin to write, you begin to educate other people. 
and so that was that was tr what I was trying to do was to begin to uh, speak and write. And so between myself and Byron, it took us maybe another year and a half, and we worked out the chapters and then uh, eventually published it. And I did hire a publicist and uh, we promoted it. I did go on the, a lot of talk radio. I did a little bit of TV. Um, I did a lot of bookstores, but I, you know, I, I did influence some people that get out in the community, but I really, it didn't, it kind of, I, I was a little disappointed because the reach of it, it didn't sell well, obviously it's kind of a niche book and I may have had higher expectations than what, what it should, but I am excited today to be here to talk to you about the book, some of the concepts in there, uh, because, you know, it's been, it's been a while it's been out there. And the other thing I was going to say, I put my email in the, uh, in the chat. I do have some books left. Uh, if you want a paperback uh, copy of the book, um, I can send them out to you. So no charge, just send me your address and I'll mail you, mail you one. Um, let's start with uh, the introduction now on the book. And I'll just kind of, I have a few points highlighted. We'll, I'll go through that and then we'll open it for discussion as I work, work my way through here. So um, the first thing I start off in the, in the preface, it says, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. And that's a quote by Thomas Paine from Common Sense. And people know Common, Common Sense was, uh, he was the uh, person that wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense during the American Revolution, which basically was a way of informing uh, people out there and it really led to the, uh, the American Revolution. And that's the idea that we are trying to promote a, a revolutionary concept out there. And I have to say that Really, one of the things that I, I would recommend to people, I, I read a book, and this is after I've written One World Democracy called Sapiens, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, which is a best selling book. And he talks about story. And sorry, my computer slid. Uh, story is very important. And I, I think that's what we're really trying to do is change the story out there. Uh, and, and that's the idea of this, this book or any book that's uh, trying to come up with new ideas is you want to change the story people have in their heads. So we go on to say, um, this book is an introduction to the greatest political transforma transformation in history, the democratic revolution to create enforceable global law. And so that's really what, uh, you know, the introduction is about. It's about saying that, hey, we want to bring civilization to the global level. Currently, we have levels of government. We have local government. We have, uh, you know, state government, county government, national government. Uh, when you get to the international level, we don't have government. We have uh, what I would call a state of relative anarchy. And that state of relative anarchy is what creates the trouble in the world, meaning the military problems, the lack of coordinated effort uh, towards problems like global warming or poverty. And so that's why I'm uh, promoting that. So I'm going to read you another part on here. Yet something more than rejectionism is needed from our progressive leaders. These times require a positive and practical vision for how to solve international conflicts, how to relieve global poverty, and how to end the physical destruction of our precious planet. And this kind of gets back to that concept that the peace movement, there is a, a large peace movement out there, but it does not promote world federalism. It, it promotes the idea of we're just going to stop war. We're not going to do war by a variety of means. It doesn't seem to uh, substitute a... Uh, a concrete uh, plan which world federalism offers. And so that, that's part of what we need to do. And then is, uh, I go on to say, truly representative governments of all humanity that our current United Nations currently really does not represent uh, humanity. It doesn't have um, a direct representation. Imagine a global legislature or a parliament uh, whose first order of business is the abolition of war. Well, that really was what the concept is, and that's why we're all here, is to work on that idea that we can move civilization, and civilization, of course, is based on law, uh, to the global level. And that idea is to abolish war, that, uh, you know, war is basically legalized murder, and it's a crazy concept. It's, you know, humans hunting other groups of humans, and it's, you know, it needs to be abolished just like slavery was abolished in the, in the 1800s. We, the people of the planet Earth, are the sovereigns of our destiny. We stand together. And now we're going to talk a little bit about, I guess, sovereignty. Uh, in our view, today's world's peace movement is, is too often marked by a naive utopianism that confuses human nature with angelic nature, 
Angels can live in peace without law and government, but humans cannot. There is no peace without justice, no justice without law, and no law without government. This, this idea that there's no law without government is, is one of the heart of, you know, kind of the heart of the book, the idea that you need enforceable global law. We have international law, it's based on treaties, and that treaty system is not enforceable if a country wants to withdraw from a treaty, such as North Korea withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and went on to develop nuclear weapons, that they can. They have that option. It's always an option. It doesn't mean the treaties are not valuable. They're very valuable in terms of creating an understanding between countries like uh, Israel and Egypt and Jordan have a, have a treaty that's held, a peace treaty. Okay, we go on to, we go on to say, let us use the 21st century to create the end of war, not the end of humankind. To abolish war, we will need enforceable global law, the expansion of civilization to a planetary scale. This book invites you to a lifelong journey to the achievement of planetary peace and prosperity. Let's get there by working to build one world democracy. Okay. And then I go on and that, now we'll start chapter, chapter one. Uh, the first quote is, today we must develop federal structures on a global level. We need a system of enforceable world law, a democratic federal world government to deal with world problems. Walter Cronkite. This book is about the proposition that there really is no acceptable future without enforceable global laws that will outlaw war, redistribute resources, and control pollution. Now, part of the reason I, I, I choose to you know, write the book or work in this area as an activist is that I think that the abolition of war will change things in the world. It will free up resources. So much resources are used for the war machine, so much intellectual energy, so much effort goes into the war machine that it's like there's nothing, there's not enough left to straighten out all the other problems in the world. And if we don't solve it, it's not a utopian vision, it's a vision of, um, you know, just survival. The idea that, you know, if we don't do this world federalism, that it's about survival, it's not really about creating a utopian. So Albert Einstein, who wrote, the UN now and world government eventually must serve one single goal, the guarantee of the security, tranquility and welfare of all mankind. And then we go on to the Apollo astronauts reported great epiphanies as they viewed the planet from deep, deep space for the first time and it created a vision. I think the, I think people's vision has to change. They have to view themselves as, um, you know, global citizens, not, uh, you know, members just of a nation state. The vision of a unified humanity has been growing ever since the 1960s. Okay, that's kind of the idea. You know, I grew up in the 1960s. And it was all about peace, love, and understanding. And I think those ideas influenced me, the, the idea that we don't have to hate each other, have an enemy. I always thought it was bizarre. Growing up, it was the Russians were the enemy. And I always was a little confused because my family had come from Russia. <laughs> um, light, Byron goes on, Byron quoted, he wanted to come up with a term that kind of uh, differentiated world federalists from the normal peace-loving progressives. And he came up with enlightened progressives as that term. The anti-war movement will grow similar to the way the abolition, abolitionist movement grew to eliminate slavery in the US in the 19th century. Okay. Uh, and then we'll go on to say, there was a, uh, Talking about uh, Gary Davis, which I, and, uh, you know, I think some, a lot of people here are very familiar with yeah. Gary Davis. Maybe some people aren't. Gary yeah, Davis was. Gary, we read his book. We, okay, so, you did. Uh, this group All is right. very familiar with him. All right, so I, I'll film. go on from there. Yeah. Uh, there's a quote saying, a flag of sovereignty of one government of the world. Uh, does the evolution of sovereignty end with the nation states? Do individuals have rights only as citizens of nations, but not as citizens of the world? Um, so that's the idea. We'll talk a little bit about sovereignty. To get at an answer, we must first ask what sovereignty actually is and from where it is derived. Uh, originally, it, it was from the throne. It was the throne directed directly by God, meaning he had the divine right of kings, that this was the idea that we were sovereign. And it, later, you had the, uh, the revolution. You had the enlightenment. 
you know, the Enlightenment led to the American Revolution. It led to the French Revolution. It led to, uh, you know, the, what's called the Enlightenment, the Renaissance. And this went on to create the modern democracy. And so the world is still in that. Uh, we're still seeing that transition from democracy uh, versus authoritarianism right now. Later theorists have held that sovereignty is inherent and inalienable in the individual persons and cannot as such be transferred, cannot as such be transferred to government. They have argued that the people simply grant powers of governing to different levels of government when it is legitimate, or that dictators may temporarily usurp people's in, innate sovereignty when government is illegitimate. And then um, I go on to talk about sovereignty a little bit. And this came from um, uh, Emery Reeves' Anatomy of Peace. He really wrote a great book that was uh, part of the original World Federalist Movement. And it, we talked about uh, Pax Romana. And it, it is, as you have, the Romans used to conquer countries, uh, conquer places, and they did not destroy them. They would integrate them into the Roman Empire. And this is the idea of empire, that you have peace within an empire because you have a central government. So whether it's democratic or not, if you have a central government, you have sovereignty above you, uh, generally you're going to have peace. When, when sovereignty breaks down, you, you, some, if there's conflict, you have war. I uh, talked about Europe fared better than the Islamic world in the transition to modern forms of sovereignty and democracy. Um, without, here it is. Okay, this is the essence of what I think um, Anatomy of Peace was talking about. Without exception, all such instances of broadening and sharing of sovereignty has resulted in peace within the larger sovereign unit. Retrogressions have usually led right back to an outbreak outbreak of fratricidal conflict. Uh, and, and I go on to talk about uh, examples of this, like uh, Yugoslavia, when it broke up, uh, it, it was at peace and then it broke up. And then you had the war in the Balkans in the 90s because they were all separate units. War and anarchy can be eliminated only when a new sovereign source of law is set up over and above the old clashing group, creating an... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, my computer slipped off. I have it on a raise it up. Um, uh, I kind of lost my place. Let me go back to that. Sorry. So I'm talking about sovereignty and that sovereignty uh, can be transferred upward or downward. And then that the UN, talking about the UN, because that really is the, the question of the day, is how does the UN need to be reformed? And how, how does the UN kind of fall short on these things? And it doesn't represent, uh, it represents, uh, it represents um, nations and their interests, but it does not represent uh, people. Okay, now we'll go on to the, the case for global law. World federalism is an idea that will not die. More and more people are coming to realize that peace must be more than an interlude if we are to survive, that peace is a product of law and order, and that law is essential if the force of arms will not rule the world. And that was William O. Douglas. That was a quote. Uh, as advocates of democracy, as global Democrats of the future, we are in the best position to represent the great truth that the world's people, not the world's nation states, are the true sovereigns of this planet. And we go on that eventually we need a global constitution, universal bill of rights to protect the rights of individuals. And the other thing that it basically comes down to, down to this, which is the force of law versus the law of force that we live in a world at the international level where um, military force is really how things are decided and that we want to replace that with a system of law rather than military force. And then we go on a simple truth. Peace, peace requires the rule of law. And we t I give the example of um, large federations in the world where there's peace now. So in, in Canada, India, the European Union, the United States, citizens do not worry about the, their states or provinces going to war against each other. So that's the idea that there are places in the world where there used to be war. Europe used to be at war for centuries. 
two world wars. Now they're at peace. That's because they have the European Union. The United States originally used to have uh, fighting between the, the groups. Um, this guy, the only way to abolish war entirely is to establish the just rule of enforceable world law. And Jerry, just let me cut in to let you know we have a little bit over a half hour for the Q&A part. So just okay. to, just so for, we're in at, terms of pacing. Okay. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to get to wrapping it up and then we can get into the discussion, I think. Global law is meaningful only if it is enforceable. Global laws require global courts of justice. Enforceable rule law is an idea whose time has come. And then we go on from the world citizenship to world democracy. I am a citizen of Athens, not Greece, but of the world. By virtue of physically inhabiting the same planet, human beings everywhere suffer in common from such maladies as nuclear proliferation, global warming, and the war system that forces every country to waste vast resources on arms. So I think that's really, I think that's really it on these, on these chapters. Uh, it's, it's about, you know, it really is about uh, countries coming together forming a union such as the best example i see is the european union that's happened recently uh we don't worry about war between germany and france or you know uh so th these ideas that uh we can do this at the global level form a global union i think this is the way to go and obviously most of you do too there's some people maybe it's new to an introduction uh it's a simple idea but it is an idea that we need to promote and I want to open it up for questions and discussion, that kind of thing at this time. So Bob, do you want to handle the- Sure, sure, I'll, I'll take care of it. Um, so right. first, Jerry, thank you so, so much. That was very clear. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad we have it recorded. That's all I can say, that was very good. Um, so yeah, so um, again, I invite people to raise their cyber hand, go to the bottom of your screen, click on reactions and then click on raise hand. If you can't do that, then you could raise your human hand. Um, and there are already several people in line, so I'll go in the order. So starting with uh, Arthur, then Tad, then Donna, and then Gail. So take it away, Arthur. And you all have to unmute. Unmute a second. Yes. There we go. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, uh, excellent, excellent book. And I also wanted to point out and especially thank Jerry for being one of the first funders before we even made the movie about Gary Davis, he was one of the funders, his local World Federalist chapter was one of the funders that made that movie possible. That's now out on PBS stations across the country and more. So uh, thank you so much for that. And thanks for, for mentioning uh, Gary Davis. And uh, uh, I, I think one of the exciting things that Martin mentioned on the Tom Hartman show is that he's going to be... Uh, Author, I must ask you to get to your question. Make it a we question. Have a, lot, a lot of people to get in, and I want to make sure we're fair to everyone. So please get right. to your question. Okay. So I guess the question, uh, the question is, um, if, if um, whether you see a way that uh, we could use uh, mass media to and 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 uh, and movies and so on to elevate this idea of world citizenship into the global consciousness, whether, whether it isn't the culture uh, of violence and the TV shows that constantly depict war and conflict that are in large measure responsibility both for creating that and whether the key solution may not be so much arguing or having all the right facts and figures, but being able to use entertainment to, uh, to change the public. What do you think about how World Federalists could get involved in that? Thank, thank you, Arthur. I think that's a key question. And it's, you know, unfortunate, but the idea of world federalism is held by a group of intellectuals, by political activists, by college professors. Uh, it's the people looking around you right here. Uh, it's not something that's in the political debate. It's not being, you're not, you don't hear, you know, people giving speeches and debating about it. You don't hear it in the news media. Uh, and that's our goal is to be, and that was my goal in writing the book, was to be a better communicator so that we could communicate our message to a wider audience so that this wider audience would debate it, that it would be part of, we would have a political voice. 
and I think part of that political voice is obviously writing books, but videos are very important. Movies are very important because one thing I did find with writing a book is that it's difficult to get people to read a whole book. They want it in an easy format. They also want to be entertained. They want it what's called edutainment. Um, and that's how you really reach the masses. I, I, I've seen this on YouTube. Uh, I've seen it on, uh, you know, educators do this. You have to have a way of reaching them. And so I think what Arthur's doing with a movie is very important. And, you know, I have the ambition at some point to do a movie, uh, you know, a video or, you know, something of high quality that would have go viral or have some reach. Um, the other thing that I, I found recently, um, I started going, there's a new social media and it's called Clubhouse. And it doesn't have any visual component. It's kind of like talk radio. You go on, it's just got a picture of you. But there's great discussions on there. There was a discussion that went for two weeks solid. I mean, two weeks nonstop between Israelis and Palestinians. And it was fascinating. I, I listened to this for like, you know, on and off for a couple of weeks. Um, and they were discussing, these were people from Gaza, from Palestine, from, you know, Israel and all around the world talking about this. But I see something like that. I, I want to do have my own thing for world federalism and do it on there. And I am looking for people, what's called co-moderators. So if any of you have an interest in that uh, going on and you want to join Clubhouse, uh, I can get you on there. It's by invite only to get on, but I can help you get on. And if you have any interest, uh, we can do that. But I think movies, videos, all of that, uh, it's great. We have to reach out um, in different ways. And we got to be creative. And uh, I know a lot of you have, you've, you've reached out in all different kinds of ways, but uh, it's not a silver bullet. It's uh, the full shotgun approach. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Arthur and Jerry. Okay, going to Ted. Thank you, Bob Flax. Uh, thank you, Jerry Tettleman. Great to see you uh, after some years um, for your both your presentation and to you and Byron for writing this book. Um, I, I, have, I have a real question historical question, Jerry. Um, I am not only a fan of your book, but like you, a fan of the Emery Reeves book, which you uh, mentioned. Um, and Reeves, as you indicated, he tells this story of the Roman Empire, clearly not democratic, but it was a universal political authority over a vast territory that really brought Pax Romana for 500 years. Then the next part of Reeves' story is when the Roman Empire disappeared within a century or two, there were the Dark Ages, which were primarily about hundreds of small sovereign political units who engaged in constant warfare with each other. And then the third and final part of Reeves' his, of the history tale that Reeves tells is that those hundreds of units consolidated into the modern nation states uh, which abolished war on those tiny levels, but of course wars and perpetual preparation for war has continued uh, among those sovereign states to this day. Uh, you articulated that in your book. Um, here is my question, Jerry, for you and maybe for other, some of the other people of erudition and historical knowledge on this call. I feel like when we tell that history tale, um, and it, it, making our case for larger units of political sovereignty as a mechanism for ending war. It's very Eurocentric. Um, it's, it's true, it's, it's a real true story, but it, it's just like as if the whole history of the world is the history of Europe. And I'm asking you and or others now or later for other examples throughout the vast sweep of human history over the whole planet where dozens if not hundreds of political units engaged in incessant war and then consolidation brought about the abolition of war. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the examples, there's example after example. Uh, India used to be a series of little kingdoms and they basically came together and they are, are now, you know, one big nation. It's a federation. Uh, you have, you know, Italy used to be little kingdoms. They came together. They were nation. Now they're part of the European Union. Uh, you know, you can look at the current world, you even have, you have China, China used to be also different, different parts, it's now one nation. Unfortunately, China is an authoritarian state versus a democracy, you know, the peace part works, whether it's democracy or authoritarian. But of course, we want democratic, but we also want not a unitary state, we want federation, meaning levels of government. 
um, which you don't have in China. China is not a federation. Uh, and you want limited government because even, you know, we've seen with Brexit that uh, Britain decided they didn't want to be part of the European Union because they thought uh, Brussels, the European Union is overreaching, mostly about immigration, I think. But, uh, you know, you see some pushback on that. If you get too much control, it's a balancing act. You want, you want um, self-determination and you want levels of government. But if there's a lack of self-determination, if the government is too too much control, um, you have pushback there. So it, it's kind of a balancing act. You definitely, if there is a year, uh, you know, when there is a world government, it has to be limited in scope. And that's, that's really important because people, it's the number one objection that I get in discussing this topic is we don't want a, a totalitarian government. We don't want some foreigners telling us what to do. Thank right. you. Thank you, Ted and Jerry. Uh, moving on to Donna, then Ron, and then Gail. Thank you. Um, Jerry, thanks again for this great book. As I'm rereading it, I, I recognize how it really captured me and spoke to me, and um, it's fun to read it again. Um, I have two different questions. One is <clears throat> sort of at a high level. It's the t in the title, the subtitle, and also several times you mentioned progressive. And so I think that this book is fabulous for progressives. Um, but I, I wonder if you have given any thought to how to reach out to non-progressives or to people who don't want to see themselves as progressives. Um, I don't know. That, that's sort of a um, one sort of at a high level question. Um, and my second is kind of a, a detailed question. On page 37, you talk, there's a sentence that says, the accumulation of many small victories will eventually lead to a transformation in global governance. And I wonder if you're still thinking that, that it will be sort of little steps or if you, or if you, if, if that's where you're still thinking or maybe something else, some, some other transformation. Okay. Thanks. Thank thank you, Donna. Uh, as far as the uh, progressives, I think that maybe it's a limiting term, but I think I was just, uh, you know, I wanted to do that because there was this peace movement going on. People view themselves as progressive, meaning the progressives want change. Um, most of the time, conservatives, the idea is you want to maintain the status quo. And so there was a difference that most of the change, that term kind of referred throughout American history, there was this idea that you're prog making progress, you're progressives, you're, you're creating change. And we wanted a change. And so I think that reflected that idea. Does it limit people? Yes. I think the political climate now has made progressives kind of, you know, uh, th there's such a divide. When I wrote the book, the, the country wasn't as harshly divided as it is now. We have this great political divide now that was started, you know, with Trump. Well, didn't start with Trump, but was exacerbated by Trump. So um, I, I think it wasn't as divisive as a term as it turned out to be 15, 16 years later. Uh, the other thing you were asking was um, about, what was it again you're asking about? Um, you're on mute. You went oh, off. Oh. And then, uh, yeah. on, on page 37, you mentioned that we'll get there. Oh, by oh yeah, incrementalism. Yeah. You're, you're talking yeah. about in incrementalism against one big leap or, you know, several big leaps. I think it's going to be both. You know, you're going to have you're going to have incremental movements. We we got the uh, International Criminal Court. Uh, that was an incremental, uh, you know, bringing a actual enforceable law to a certain level. Um, we might get a you know a, a global parliament, you know, a, a global assembly. We might get you know we we may have some incremental changes that will help us to get there. But at some point, you actually make the full move and you become a union. Um, I see, you know, I see the idea of a uh, union of the democracies as really one of the things that's much more doable than a, a total transformation of the UN. And I see that as, as a big step, but there's steps. So how it plays out, I really don't know. It could be a series of incremental steps, but at some point there's a, a big leap and you, you do go to a constitution, a new government, a, you know, you, you do some dramatic things happen. That's the idea. So, Okay. Great. Thank you, Donna and Jerry. On to Ron. You'll need to go off mute, Ron. Ron, you'll need to go off mute. Jerry, I do want to thank you again for writing the book and for being with us for the discussion of the book. It does seem to me that one 
big obstacle confronting us is nationalism. But when we think of nationalism, it really has two different aspects. One is political, the governmental. The, another one is language. And right now, English is kind of taking over the world, but it bothers me a little bit about all the people who are not speakers of English. And many people find English very difficult to learn. If you're gonna have a democracy, people have got to be able to communicate with each other. I do think that one of the big problems we're having right now is that English speaking people are talking to other English speaking people, but not to people who are not speakers of English. Fortunately, we do have some Esperance. One of the really great things that happened in China, not only were they required to learn English, but some of them at the same time learned Esperanto. And having learned, well, uh, there's one fellow, Huang Yinbao, who has a daughter who had learned English and studied it and used it, but it, after 10 years, she couldn't use it very well. His younger son learned English, but he also learned Esperanto, and he learned Esperanto and was able to become fluent in the Esperanto community in just over a year. The Esperanto was so much easier to learn. So I think one thing English speaking people need to recognize is that we cannot just unite English speaking people or people okay. who know English. We have to go wider than that. And that means including Asia. And fortunately now, because of the fellow I mentioned, Huang Yumbao, he's been the leader in getting UNESCO to publish its courier in Esperanto so that it's now available to get UNESCO courier in Esperanto. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ryan. Uh, you know, understanding is really the basis of peace. If you, if you ask people what is the what makes peace, this means that you have an understanding with your other party as to what you're going to do and how things are going to go. So, if you have the language, that's very important for negotiating. You have to understand each other. If you have laws, you got to be clear. So, yes, it, it is it is critical. Esperanto is a you know a designed language made to be clear and easy uh, to learn. I, it may take off, I don't know, but I know there's some technological things going on as far as translating that are very helpful. Um, we have Google Translate now. We have supposedly even Zoom is working on this. The, the next big thing they're trying to do is to be able to instantly translate so that you can have a call in other languages and have the translation done. Uh, now, hopefully that gets perfected because I've seen some of the translations that get done and it's not always exact. You know, you can have some misunderstandings, which probably can make it worse. But um, I, I think it's a big deal. And, and I think the other thing is that um, we do have to include the world. This is a weird, this is a, a, a touchy subject in the World Federalist Movement is that do you go for the whole world to be part of an inclusive world? It's part of this global democracy, such as the UN being transformed and all of a sudden everybody becomes in, involved. Or do you create a union of the democracies and my answer to that is both you know you you want to have the democracies united but you also need like what the un is where you have an inclusive inclusive one i don't know that you should do both at the same time uh meaning that the same organization when you, when you give uh power to countries that are tyrannical or authoritarian you run the risk that uh in a in a government that your government becomes that way so it's a big question, but uh, I think we just have to push on and 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 see how it evolves. You can't always control these things. It's it's really it evolves and events happen and takes it takes its path. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, Gail, and then I put myself in the queue. Go ahead, Gail. Um, a response to one thing you said, Jerry, just now about understanding is sort of the the, the key. I, I guess I would um, disagree with that. I mean, I think there are conflicts based on misunderstandings, but there are also conflicts that are um, 
con um, of conquest where one power just feels they can do whatever they like. It's not really a misunderstanding. It's, you know, no matter what the other party thinks, um, they're gonna, you know, the, and this well, is sort well, of, I, I think of the US here, you know, no matter what right. Saddam had said, uh, the US was determined to invade. Well, when I'm re referring to understanding, I'm saying that peace is created by having an understanding. And that's really what a treaty is. It's an understanding. It says, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We have an understanding. And then okay, you the can codify part. that into law. I'm saying that peace is that way. I'm not saying that what you're saying about countries okay. can invade. That It's not a misunderstanding. It's that you're exactly saying that some countries are colonists, some countries are taking advantage. They, you know, you, you might have somebody doing that. But to create the peace, peace, the first step in peace is to have an understanding between parties. Uh, and so that's, you know, it's a first step. It's not the end of it. It's, it's just the beginning. Okay. But my question um, has to do with, I was really, uh, the thing that really struck me about what I read so far in your book is how you talked about when um, territories became, you know, bigger and the extension of sovereignty then yeah. extended peace. And that also the times when sovereignty broke down, then you had conflicts again. And I'm wondering if anybody has looked at that systematically and, um, you know, like kind of come up with a, a compilation of of though of both you know the extension of sovereignty and the, its correlation of peace and the breakdown of that if there are any exceptions I mean I'm thinking that could be really useful because that's that's really you could say um, an empirical test of our our general hypothesis isn't it so it this yeah. provides evidence and it could be really i think compelling it, you can see it what what happens is uh countries uh, you know you, you have this grouping of countries and then they break down let's take the soviet union so the soviet union was a was a group of countries and then the at the end of the soviet union and these countries became independent so some of them have had a relationship that is peaceful with uh russia other ones have had conflicts. You have a conflict with Ukraine. Uh, they, they've, they've, uh, other countries, Lithuania, Estonia, they've joined NATO and they've joined uh, the European Union. Um, it depends whether there's a conflict or not, meaning that there has to be um, like some kind of hatred, some kind of thing that they both want, some kind of, uh, you know, it's usually a, a difference in their stories. They're so different that they, you know, they can't mesh those two stories together. So it doesn't necessarily mean if you don't have a union, it doesn't necessarily mean you will have war. For example, the United States and Canada are two separate countries. We're two sovereign states, but we have no conflict. There's no border dispute. There's no issue between us. And so we don't have the we don't have the idea of going to war, even though we're, we're two sovereign countries. But if two sovereign countries uh, have a conflict like Ukraine and Russia, then you have war. You, you know, you have that, you have a conflict to work out. So that really is, is, is the heart of it. It, it. it doesn't by itself, it doesn't create war or, or stop it necessarily. It's, it has to do with conflict. Thank I hope you, that helped Gail. you. I hope that helped you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Gail and Jerry. Okay. I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll take another line because we do have time for a second round of questions or open discussion. Um, so first a couple of quick comments and then a specific question to Jerry. Um, go going back to what Ron said about, you know, needing something other than English, um, I just wanted to point out that the timing of, the, of your comment, Ron, is so perfect. Just like yesterday or the day before, we were having a conversation in preparation for the Congress coming up next, next month, uh, not next, next week. And it was uh, people from various countries around the world, and somebody um, from a non-English speaking country made the observation that in WFM, it's the English speakers that are running the show. And, and the, the non-English speakers, several of them kind of jumped in and agreed um, that that's, that's not good. So it just, you know, the, the timing of your observation is, is perfect. That, that just came up in one of our conversations. 
Uh, second to Gail, I just wanted to underscore what, what I think Gail was asking for, is there certainly is lots of anecdotal stories, like what we've just been saying about, you know, when you unify smaller groups, you know, peace prevails. Um, but I think what Gail was asking is, is, are there research studies so you can show the numbers? It's like, show me the numbers, you know? And that would act, and, and I believe there are. Um, the, the, you know, the whole field of peace studies and peace research in the last few decades has looked at things like that. And that would be a very good number to have and have on our website and have as part of our story. So we can kind of show it in, in concrete terms. So that was my, 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 my thing there. Um, but my question to Jerry, um, is you made a, a very quick uh, you know, comment that was almost like a side comment, but I wanted to go back to it. I, it, it got me curious. When you said that Europe fared better than the Islamic world in moving into modernity, essentially, what do you attribute that to? Or do you? I mean, have you thought oh, about I, that? I can tell you what it's attributed okay. to. Okay, okay. Uh, it's attributed to the printing press. Uh, uh -huh. in, in the Europe, the printing, Gutenberg came out with the Bible and the printing press, and that, that caused the information age. They were allowed in Europe to print not just religious material, but to print other things. And so this created the information age. But in the Islamic world, the only thing you could print was the Quran. You could not print uh, anything other than, you know, Islamic Quran or Islamic things. You could not, uh, you, there wasn't freedom of the press and so this was this held, uh, you know, the Islamic world developed a different path. You know, it took a, a different path in Europe. And I think it started with the printing press that the printing press is what led to the Renaissance. It's what led to the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment thinkers are the ones that led to the idea that man is equal, that the kings, of the, you know, the, the idea of kings is, is ridiculous and led to the American French revolutions. So they took a different path and, you know, they did have their golden ages where they studied, you know, math and different things. And, you know, uh, it, they did things that uh, medicine and things that were, were, uh, were, you know, intellectual, but they were restricted for, you know, centuries on what they could print. Thank you. Terrific. Um, so before I take another cue, I, I do want to point out that back in the time of Gutenberg, the idea of man being equal uh, was an acceptable term, uh, but now man, women, and other genders uh, are equal. It would be the way we, we put it together now. Um, so, um, so, okay, so I, I, I will call for another round of hands if there are any folks who have questions or comments. And this time, if there are a few, I will call on the people, instead of the order, on the people who have not yet spoken, um, if there are any. And we might have um, answer, okay. Um, so we'll get Barat and anybody, or Barrett, I think I, I realized I said it wrong. Uh, anybody else after Barrett? Okay, I'll, I'll put myself in the queue also. So Barrett, why don't you uh, start off? And you got to go off mute. You are still on mute. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, well, I was just saying thank you, Jerry. Your book is very inspiring and it's also easy to read, which is an important point. Because uh, many inspiring books, I sometimes give up after a while. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how to phrase my question, but I'll be brief. Uh, I'm reminded uh, when I was a, I came from India and as a graduate student at the University of Rochester in physics, uh, we were all in the 60s, we were all invited as a welcome to America by the president of the university. And a fellow Indian uh, uh, student in physics uh, with me uh, was standing next and the principal went to the president went from each new a uh, foreign student to another asking them where they were from and so on. And he came to me and I said, well, I'm Bharat Parak, I'm from India. He came to Ajit Mohanty, the next student. And he says, well, I'm from um, Ajit Mohanty. I'm from the great state of Bengal. And uh, President Wallace looked at me, uh, is that a country? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that kind of, uh, 
And Ajit was a very brilliant physicist and a, and a very compassionate man. So I'm concerned about the kind of uh, human nature which uh, so closely aligns itself to its tribe to be able to be compassionate enough to include everyone else equally. And how do we make that transformation? It, and that's Thank you. It's a, it's a great it's a great question, Brian. Uh, I think what you're talking about, and it is called tribalism, uh, ethnocentrism. It's part of human nature, and this is where war evolved. If you look at humans, by nature we are tribal. Uh, we have an in group and an out group. The in group is your is your designated group. You have an allegiance to them. The out group they're not as significant. You can you may have a war with them. You may just ignore them. They're a foreigner. Uh, this is how we evolved, and you can see it in the animal kingdom. So as civilization has expanded, meaning the rule of law has expanded, uh, tribalism, this idea of you have just out for my tribe, has been taken care of by the rule of law. And that's why in America, we have people from all over the world that live together, but their home countries may be at war. Uh, you have Israelis living here, Palestinians living here, you have Pakistanis living here, you have Indians living here, their countries have a conflict. But when they're in America, because they're ruled under law, they all get along together because it, it's it's under law. Um, so that's the idea that we do have to transcend it. We have to redefine our story of who we are. And that's where the where the idea of global citizen comes in. The idea that we're part of the human family, we see our in group as the human family as uh, not, and some people extend it beyond that they extend it to nature, that nature is part of our in group. Um, so we have to change the way I th we think and our story, and we have to support that with the laws that move civilization to the global level. So I think your idea of tribalism, it's unfortunately very much alive today. It, it hasn't gone away and it, it won't go away, but we will still have our group. Like the idea is to move to a system like in America, uh, oh, we all love our football team and our city and we cheer for them but we don't have let's say san diego and los angeles fighting because of their because of that uh it's just a a rivalry in terms of sports and so that's the idea is move towards like what the olympic is we can have rivalry we can have all that uh conflict but on the sports field not on the battlefield thank you thank you um anyone else who has not yet spoken before we take second second comments Okay, anybody who has spoken, who has another question or comment. Um, okay, we'll go back to Bharat, I'm in line, and anyone else, if we have time, can jump in. Jerry, it just happens that you have a meeting with Hu Jinping, uh, the president of China. Uh, and he would agree with you that one world is great. It's ruled by China. Yeah. Okay. So now question is, what kind of a, a discussion, what kind of a dialogue can you have with him to be able to come to think in terms of what you're saying in the book? And if you succeed in that, we will have a one world democracy. Yeah. Well, this, this is really the heart of the, one of the questions that world federalists have is what do you do with countries that are authoritarian uh, versus democracies? Should we just have a union of the democracies, basically the model that the European, unions, U, European Union followed, which is they want countries that are democracies and they have a standard uh, versus the all-inclusive model that the UN is, has followed? Um, I think you have to have an agreement between whether a countries are a democracy or not, if you leave these countries out, you're going to have a very conflicted world. And so I think we do have to have agreement between China, Russia, uh, other players in the world that are significant that are not democracies, that we come to an agreement as to what uh, countries can and cannot do. Um, after World War II, the idea of one country invading another country and colonizing that country has become taboo. It's not you know, a written law, but that concept, whenever you see it breached, you saw it breached in Ukraine or when the United States went into Iraq, 
there's a big pushback in the international community. And so I think really what we're hoping for is countries like China, Russia, authoritarian countries, is to have a set of laws that are agreed to by these by the whole world that you know we we don't do these things. And of course, the big thing is the abolition of nuclear weapons. Um, there was a bill passed, you know, to abolish nuclear weapons. Most of the states have have signed that bill, and it's the nuclear states that haven't. And I think that would be an area where China, you know, could uh, could agree to that if we had an agreement between all the nuclear powers to do this. Uh, this is a huge thing. This is really an existential threat, and we should focus on that first before we, you know, do some of the other things. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll let Ron cut in before me, and then I'll begin to move toward closure. Let me just say, with regard to tribalism, language is also a basis of tribalism. And fortunately, we can learn more than one language. My experience with the Esperanto community has been when you can communicate with people, then you start feeling we are members of the same community. Thank you, Ron. I, th I think that's, you know, you have to be able to communicate. The other thing is travel. Uh, you know, they say if you travel, you will get rid of your racism, your, you know, your xenophobia and your tribalism. Get out in the world and travel internationally and it, it will change you in terms of that. You'll start to understand people. You'll start to understand other cultures, other languages. Uh, so I think that's helpful. We've done all kinds of things in the world to exchange cultures and we've built a global community. And of course, Community is the precursor to government. Now we need the uh, some sort of way to the world to govern itself. But uh, I agree with you, Ron. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We do have another moment or two for something really quick. And I saw Tad's hand shoot up. So go for it, Tad. I just want to, uh, two things. One, just really endorse, as I have done before and will again, uh, Ron Glossop's uh, insistence on talking about Esperanto or perhaps some other kind of world unification language, a universal second language, more precisely. I just applaud you for pushing that, Ron, um, in, in a way that so few people do. Um, and I want to report to you, Ron, that I just finished reading a, a book by Danielle Archibugi. Yeah. Uh, he is a professor uh, of political science at the London School of Economics. It's called The Global Commonwealth of Citizens. He is one of these political science theorists. Um, many of them are involved in the World Government Research Network that a lot of us don't know that much about, but there, there's a universe of professional IR and political science theorists who do talk about um, world government as a, a theoretical concept. And in that book, uh, Ron, uh, to my delight, uh, Professor Archibugi really talked, has a whole chapter on, on a universal second language. So you're not the only one, Professor. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Dad. Okay. Um, any other quick comments, especially from anyone who hasn't said anything? Going on? Okay, Maria, you just take yourself off mute. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Jerry. Um, okay, I've been reading the first three chapters of the book, and I just was wondering. Um, I think. What we're not talking about is uh, this is to actually achieve a world government is not a things of countries. It's not something that countries will decide. It's something that people have to decide. And I think the biggest fear that people have is that their lifestyle will change. You know, how, how is this gonna affect me personally in, in my life? And I think this is about the resources that we have access. And wars and, and, and conflicts are always about resources. You know, we, I am from Paraguay. We here have a lot of fear because we have the biggest um, water reserve in the world under our country and which are with Brazil. But it's like, oh my God, they are going to invade us at some point and take all of our water. So that's our fear, you know, and I think everybody has this sort of fears that uh, what I have to quit in order to 
have this world government, you know? Um, am I going to have to stop eating meat forever? Am I going to change the way we use the, the clothes? You know, the fashion will change or we are not gonna be able to have so many clothes anymore. I think we, ha we have to kind of see it from that perspective and sort of paint a picture of, of a way that people can imagine how would this be in my everyday life? How, how do you imagine this? Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, you know, it's similar, like the, you know, we have water issues in, uh, I live in California and there's a drought and yet we live, we get water from the Colorado river. And so there's several States, Arizona, Colorado, California, Nevada, they get water from this river and they have to come up with agreements in order to share that water. But we never worry about one state invading the other or going to war because these are all done through courts of law. They've done through parliaments. It's done through legal means to make those the distribution of water. And that's the idea is that you have a system of government or courts. Now, as far as um, South America and the Americas in general, there's an organization called the Organization of American States, and it's a, it could be in the future something similar to the European Union, I meaning it could be developed further that we would have, you know, a more, uh, a stronger regional government and regional government in South America, Central America, and all of the Americas would be very helpful because when you have something to go to, you have, if you have some, you know, your neighbor wants something and they're taking it, you have somebody to go to, to enforce that law, to go to court to rather than go to war. So it's the idea that we need to develop regional governments besides just global government, we need to develop regional governments like the African Union uh, that can be developed. There's, there's all kinds of groupings around the world of these unions. And uh, I, I see that as an answer to it. As far as how it's gonna change people's individual lives, the biggest thing is that so much money is spent on war. So many people lose their lives over war. So many people uh, put their total mind and science into you know, the making of military that if we can save that money, resource, energy, and put it into other things, that would be very helpful. We can solve a lot of these other problems. Uh, as far as changing your individual life, it, it, it adds a layer of government, but it's not to be, you know, they're not going to dictate to you Global government should only deal with global issues, international issues. It's, it's, it's a federation of government, meaning that you still have local government, state government, national government, and then global government. So it doesn't do away with the state. It doesn't do away with the locality. It just adds a layer of government that only deals with international issues. Uh, it, it has to be limited government. So ho hopefully that uh, answered your question. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Maria and Jerry. Okay, I, I'm gonna in a moment give Jerry the last word and say anything he wants to do to wrap up this session and then go to Gail to wrap up, you know, wrap us up logistically. But but I have just two comments first since I'm last in line. Um, first, I, I, I do want to question and, and maybe reframe the notion that tribalism is a human nature or is, you, is part of human nature um, in two ways. First of all, even if it is, you know, as Jerry's example before of, of sports teams, you know, tribalism doesn't necessarily mean violence between tribes. That as we saw in the US, you know, when we had a brief period of the Articles of Confederation and then going to a constitution, that you did have states attacking each other and actually going to many wars with each other, which stopped once the structure changed. So a lot of that could, what looks like warring tribes really is influenced by context on what they're embedded in, having this greater connection. So that's the first thing that I wanna say. Um, the second thing that I wanna say is after having worked in prison for 16 years, uh, both San Quentin and another prison in California, if you were coming into prison as an inmate, you had to join a gang to survive. And I think a lot of the, the need for tribalism is the need to survive. But if the world is structured in a way where war is abolished, that need to survive, you know, and all the mobilization you have to do to do that gets lifted right out of the picture, you know? 
And you no longer have to have that allegiance to your tribe for protection. You could have allegiance to larger systems and perhaps the whole world, you know, as, as you know, so many science fiction shows where the Martians come, the whole world unifies as a tribe, you know, and we protect there. So I, I think the, the tribalism, yeah, it's there. We have an affinity to those we're born with and close to, but it doesn't necessarily have to translate to violence. Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, all the kind of the meaning that we ascribe to it. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So let me turn to Jerry, anything that you wanna say? Um, I should have warned you, we, we have the advanced class here, Jerry, that you've been speaking yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been they, together, many of us, for several years reading oh, yeah, a number yeah, of I, these I, books. I, I realize so, that. Yeah, so anything uh, yeah, you wanna sure, say? Sure, yeah. I'll make a couple final comments and stuff. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, critical that we stay optimistic, that we press on, that we, we find the persistence to get this done. Uh, and I know some of you have been persistent is uh, unbelievable. You know, you, you've stated with this for years and years, and uh, that's really what it takes. Uh, I was watching a show the other day. It was called, it was on Amazon and it was uh, inventions that shook the world. And th this guy come, this guy's describing how he invented the hybrid car, you know, which is uh, like a Prius or, you know, uh, the hybrid, he invented it 25 years before it actually went in production and it was he had a fully functional prototype and the government and the car industry didn't want to talk to him didn't want to do it he did it in the 1970s during the gas crisis he had perfected it and it would have saved unbelievable amount of fuels but it didn't happen till 25 years later and i think that we're in a similar thing that you know I, i've written this book and it's been uh 16 years ago and I think some of these issues are still just as relevant today. Maybe some of my references are out of date, but it's still a, an issue and, and we have to think long-term and we don't know when our breakthrough will be. All of a sudden, this may become a hot topic. It may be take off, people may take action and it takes that persistence. And, we, and I know a lot of us feel that we're on a plateau and that what we're doing, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. We've kind of plateaued but that's how it is when you're like exercising or doing sports, you hit a plateau and then all of a sudden you get the breakthrough. So I, I just want to encourage people to be persistent and uh, carry on. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jerry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll turn it over to Gail. If there's anything that you want to say to wrap up and then Gail, I do have a few minutes after the meeting, if you want to stay on and debrief. Right. Well, the next three chapters for our next session, which will be on um, August, ah, what did I say? August 14, the second Saturday of next month, the next three chapters are four, five, and six, the need for a global legislature, the war system and the wisdom of federation, and how do we create a world government? So, you can dig into those chapters. Um, you have the PDF version, so it's readily accessible. And um, I'll be sending, you know, information reminders. So great. Thanks I, very I, much, Jerry, for yeah. okay. joining us. It was very yeah. helpful, I think. Yeah. And I just you. want to let people know that that I will not be with you next time. I will actually be on a Buddhist retreat. Oh, and I realized seeing author's hand up reminded me that we didn't do the announcement. So I, I do want to take a moment to do that. And apologies to anybody who had announcements. Uh, but yes, I, I, I will not be with you next time. I will be in the Rocky Mountains outside of Boulder, Colorado, uh, on a Buddhist retreat with a fellow who's been a he's both a philosophy professor and a, a Zen priest and one of the leading uh, thinkers in terms of bringing Buddhism and social activism together particularly in the area of ecology and the environment. Um, so, um, so having said that, so Gail, is there anything that else that you wanted to say? And then I'll let both Arthur and David make any Go ahead. Okay, uh, and again, apologies to uh, both of you then for uh, skipping over that part. So Arthur, why don't you go first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Well, uh, that retreat sounds great. I hope you have a good, wonderful, uh, uplifting, enlightening time. Uh, two announcements, first of all, uh, Donna Park and uh, uh, the Young World Federalists, I put in the chat there, uh, will be our podcast guests for the People Powered Planet podcast. 
I hope you all join us every Wednesday. We have wonderful uh, guests on everything from uh, the Earth Constitution to tons of other related issues here. Uh, and that'll be 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern. Just go to that peoplepoweredplanet.com or the same place, the worldismycountry.com forward slash club. And you can just click on there to sign up and you'll get reminders to come to the meeting. Uh, so that should be very exciting with Donna and, and, and a good chance to talk with young world federalists about what they're doing. That's our focus on bringing youth into the movement. So that's very important. Uh, the second thing is that uh, on the Tom Hartman show, uh, Martin Sheen mentioned that he's working with me to develop a series that could be either on Netflix or Amazon or wherever else of taking Gary's book, My Country is the World, and making each chapter a narrative, a narrative story. Uh, you know, as, as, as Jerry frequently said during this, it's different stories that cause the wars, and it's different stories that cause us to get into nationalism instead of uh, one world. And so we want to change the world. We have to change the story. So if anybody wants to join us on that, uh, I would love, I know Jerry helped get some of our stuff started. I would love to get some seed funding to start uh, doing that. We've got to put together the package and proposal uh, and then get it to an agent where we can get it out. But there's going to be some costs in, in getting started on that. But if we could get that, Martin read Gary's book. If you have, well, you all read it at the club. He said, my gosh, every chapter reads like a, a, you know incredible story. This would be a great series. So uh, I'm very excited that he thinks that, and hopefully we'll be able to propel it into happening. So any of you want to join us in that adventure, uh, please do. And if you want to hear him say that, go to, I put it in the chat, uh, theworldismycountry.com forward slash talks, and you can watch the 10-minute replay on Tom Hardman. Uh, it's, it's quite exciting to have... Uh, Martin Sheen talking about uh, this incredible story and what uh, what, a, what an inspiring journey Gary Davis had. Great, thank you so much, Arthur. Um, and also thank you for your movie and that sounds like a fabulous project. Th thank you so much. Okay, so moving to David. And thank you'll... you, thank you, Bob, for saying oh, you'll sure. post that on the uh, website of, uh, of mm -hmm. that interview on the website, yes. thank you. <laughs> okay, David, take us home. Sure. So Gary Davis would have turned 100 years old on July 27th, this July 27th. So along with Arthur and Melanie, we're going to be doing some special things like we're going to be putting out a 100 song Spotify list, songs that relate to world peace uh, and changing the world. So look for that. The world Service Authority is going to be putting out a newsletter uh, about this and about Gary's birthday. We tried, we're, we've suggested to Google to put out a doodle for Gary's 100th birthday. Who knows if that'll really happen, but it's, it's uh, you know, an exciting thought. So I will send everybody at CGS and, and maybe the book club to our, our newsletter about Gary's birthday and some of the events uh, along with the Spotify list that we'll be doing to celebrate his birthday at the end of this month. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Have a fabulous month, everybody. Uh, don't get sunburned and uh, see you next time. Thank you.